am now recording this session. So if you have any questions or comments, um, they will be on recording. If you're shy, maybe you can email me afterwards. So my email address, I'm going to add um, at the end, the last slide. Well, there's my web page, so you can get me there. But at the last slide, I'll give you my email address. The um, presentation will be about an hour today, depending on questions and um, how how um, how many things come up. Uh, just remember, there's there's 40 or so of you reg are logged in now. There's about 100 people registered. So um, I, I may not be able to get to all the questions uh, and on this session. The, the dashboard that you have, the control panel that you have, has a little hand icon to the left-hand side of your uh, dashboard. I don't think you can see mine when I'm sharing the screen here. If you click the hand icon, I will open up your microphone um, to, if, as long as I can see it, uh, to give you an opportunity to ask your question. I think what's going to work better for us is if you put it down in the questions section. You can ask a question there. I'll come back and answer it. When I make this presentation larger, when I actually start presenting, I don't get to see the screen in the questions. So I'll have to break every few minutes, uh, come back and check and make sure there's no questions that are being asked. So that's how we're going to roll um, here. And just, again, just a reminder for those who are logging in, the session is recorded. All right. So the 20, here's what a little bit of background, just as a reminder. The uh, Standard Forms Committee is out of the National, uh, the Northern Virginia Association of Realtors, and they have the task of ensuring that our forms are up to date, current to the regular market, uh, consistent with law. And that committee is made up of about 20 people. And one third are attorneys, most of which are either title attorneys or litigators in the real estate world. And they are incredibly bright folks who um, have taught me a lot over the several years I've been on that committee. The rest of the committee are practitioners like you and I, who are brokers and agents, uh, representatives of large and small firms, and even some um, single agents who are just their own firm. So we've got a very good spectrum of input from practitioners. We have representatives from FAR and Dulles and um, associations as well as NVAR. The core contract is derived from a, a different group that comes from Dulles, West Virginia, Virginia, and, and uh, Maryland that come up with that core contract. So the addendums, the jurisdictional addendums, all the rest are our responsibility. So we can make changes to certain things, but not everything as of now. Now, the um, the changes you've seen get released, uh, we used to release them. Actually, this was before my time in the committee. Whenever there was changes, we just released them, and it took about six weeks to get through all the publishing and critiquing everything. And so you get them kind of all year long. Uh, and now we've gone to a twice a year. So January and July is when we'll publish changes to the forms. That makes it easier for you to track when the changes are coming, uh, to train on them for those of you. And many of you are managers or have leadership roles in your company. Um, that uh, will help you to organize when these things are happening so you're not getting new forms all year long. So the um, we'll go ahead and get on our way with the January 2014 review of what has changed. Some of you have already put these, these forms into play. I've gotten lots of phone calls, emails, and questions about them. Uh, lots of challenges to or have been fixed uh, with these changes. And then some new understandings have, have, um, have come up. So uh, we, we're really happy with the changes. We've had very little negative feedback on them. And then generally when we do, when we explain the why, uh, everybody says, aha, and they're okay with it. So this is going to be a kind of a session to talk about the, the why. So <clears throat> we're going to first start off with, well, the right way I'm doing this is we're going to start off with what the changes are. And you'll see some bullet points as to a layman's explanation of what the changes are. And then I'll slide in the paragraph from that form. In the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, you'll see the K-1020 uh, seller post-settlement occupancy. Each form has an ID and a title. So I've given you the formal ID and title in the bottom right-hand corner so you can uh, coordinate this. Uh, additionally, this video, I mean, sorry, yeah, well, this presentation is being recorded and we will make it available to one way or the other uh, after the, the class. I'll send out an email to everyone who registered. Uh, so, so long as you have a good working email, um, you'll get a, a link as to where this can be found later for review. Okay. Um, so post-settlement occupancy. This is the form that we would use when we're discussing 
uh, a seller staying in the property after the closing. And really, we didn't make too many changes to this. All we did was change to match the language in the regional sales contract, the core contract. And we added the line, except as otherwise agreed in writing. So uh, we deleted language that conflicted with the as is condition of the regional sales contract. Remember, the regional sales contract uh, a few years back changed to as is. So no longer is the seller responsible for all these repairs. Now the property conveys as is, and that's that's all we've changed here. So paragraph three is a mirror image of the intent of the core contract um, in there. So not a big change there. The next change, which seems to have been a bigger change than I think, um, it, a more impactful change than I think it needed to be. So we'll spend a couple minutes talking about that. That's K1 uh, or K1116, which is the release from the regional sales contract. This is the form that the buyer and seller execute when they've agreed to release each other from the contract. And uh, there's a line where the earnest money gets the, given to the buyer, the seller, or the, the, the listing company or, or uh, selling company, one or all of the above. So what we did was we simply removed the broker signature lines. And there's some reasons for that. The first and foremost is never ever has the broker been party to this contract. You and I as agents have personal services agreements. We have a listing agreement, we have a buyer agency agreement, and that's where um, the promise for commissions derive from our clients directly. And then for a selling agent, that commission is derived from the agreement in the MLS, the MRAS system, where the listing agent puts it in the MLS and says, selling agent, if you bring me a buyer, I'll, I'll pay you. Um, we cannot, you and I as agents nor as brokers, can stop a buyer and seller uh, from giving direction to disperse escrow in a particular manner. So we benefit from a ready, willing, and able buyer that's acceptable to the seller and agree to in writing. If the parties decide to release one another from the contract, even though there may be a pending default and it causes damage, brokers do have the right to pursue damages from the buyer or seller, whoever was the defaulting party. However, we don't have a right to stop the two parties from agreeing on the disbursement of the buyer's earnest money deposit. So a uh, couple changes, we're not a part of the contract, so we, didn't need, we never needed to sign that release. That was more of a clerical thing. We made it part of the release. And what happens from time to time is that a broker A or broker B may not be available to sign the release and it delays the disbursement of the earnest money back to the buyer so that they can move forward in another transaction or to the seller for that matter. Um, now, the release of the contract is a separate issue. So we're dealing strictly with the signatures here. By removing those signatures, we expedite the release. If Angel's buyer sends me a release and I'm the seller and I sign it and give it back, that money should be submitted or, or, or given back forthwith. If the broker has a claim to it, the broker reserves a right for a period of time to go and collect and sue for damages. Generally speaking, the EMDs that we receive of one or $5,000 are not sufficient to cover all of our damages anyways. The release of the buyer and seller does not mean that the broker doesn't reserve the right to go pursue. But we were running into issues where a broker may be on vacation for an extended period of time, medical leave, just not in the office, too busy. Uh, I personally had an occasion where we, we were holding the EMD, waiting for the other broker to sign, and they were on a three-week uh, world tour somewhere. And um, we, we went ahead and released anyway, simply for the matter we talked about here. And the question came up, well, if, it's, you know, if it requires a broker signature, should they have to sign? Uh, it doesn't. So we have um, to remove that broker line to make this thing faster, smoother, and to reflect what the current law actually is. Now, it does require some internal policies for release. So it's the brokers who, especially of larger firms, who have finance directors who are signing off on these and the brokers themselves are not writing the checks, uh, need to have some type of internal policy for tracking that the broker has acknowledged the release because the broker is ultimately responsible for it. Some firms have gone to a very simple, dear finance department, don't release escrow unless you see me initial or sign off on it. But that's not between the buyer and seller. That's simply an internal instruction to the finance person to cut the check for the EMD. Um, and again, broker still reserves the right to pursue any, any loss. Nothing came away from that. Now, one of the questions that does come up is, is there a disclosure to the buyer and seller on this form 
that the broker reserves a right to pursue damages, even if the parties mutually release? And, and the answer is no. However, it is in the listing agreement. It is in the buyer agreement. So if they are using, if you've used a standard buyer agency agreement or listing agreement, you're already covered there. That was your notice that you have the right to pursue. Uh, and you could go the extra step and, and tell them um, that, but it's, um, it's already covered elsewhere. It doesn't mean we may not consider uh, those notices as, as a firm. You know, you may have your own internal form that says buyer and seller, if you release, broker still reserves the right to pursue. The real reality of the fact is very few brokers actually do pursue. So contract release, removal of broker signatures makes it quicker, makes it more in line with what the law is and what our roles are and prohibits agent or brokers and agents from getting in the way of a buyer getting their money back or the seller getting money the buyer has uh, abandoned to them. Right. And so you see the form has stayed the same. If there's if the buyer and seller decide to give that money to the listing firm, they can still put that in here. We simply remove the signature lines. All right, pre-settlement occupancy agreement. So moving along to K-1225, this is the pre-settlement occupancy agreement in which a buyer has decided they would like to move into the property prior to closing and the seller for uh, whatever reason has decided to permit it. Now, this is a, a personal note. This is not the safest practice for anybody involved, for agents, for buyers, or for sellers. This really should be considered only out of necessity. Um, you know, only if the, that it really needs to happen, there's no other way around it because it just creates so many problems. And, and the horror stories we hear from active buyers, uh, sellers, I mean, active agents, brokers, even attorneys who represent these folks, no one seems to like this other than the fact that it's um, a necessity at times. So we do have forms to cover them. Now, a couple of things that are important to the changes. First and foremost, um, we have addressed insurance issues. Most of you remember that the seller uh, had to maintain homeowner's insurance. That still remains true. The seller still had to keep homeowner's insurance on the property during the time in which the the buyer now turned tenant for a period of time occupies the property. We removed the line that says uh, that suggested le seeking legal consultation because it, it exists everywhere in our contracts and the forms. But now we're saying that the purchaser has to also get adequate insurance before they can occupy the property. This is not a request. This is a contractual requirement and it is a shall requirement, which means they have to do it. So what this means is if I'm the listing agent and Audrey is the um, uh, selling agent and her client wants to move into my property, that we're going to have the listing firm, we're going to make sure all the paperwork's in order and we're going to want to see or we should have the right to see, even if the seller doesn't want to, we have the right to see the purchaser's evidence that they have an insurance policy in place for renter's insurance before they move in the property. This covers them for loss of of anything. Um, one of the recommendations we have been making is even if your client is just storing personal property in the house, because from time to time we'll see the buyer wants to put their stuff in the seller's garage because they don't want to pay for storage. Um, they should still have some type of insurance because the homeowner's insurance may not cover a loss if the house burns down, for example. All right, well, let me see. I've got a hand raised here. and I don't have a mouse. Hold on. There we go. All right, Melissa, go ahead. Your microphone's on. Unfortunately, I can't hear you. So Melissa, if you would, if you had a question, go ahead down to the question section and just type your question in there and I'll, I'll uh, respond to it there. I'm sorry, I don't hear your microphone. Okay, so the pre-settlement occupancy. Um, yeah, all right, so we're gonna, we deleted the requirement for legal consultation. That's in every other agreement that's out there and all the contracts say that. So. It didn't need to be here as well, uh, although it's not a bad idea to recommend that they still seek legal advice if they want to pursue pre-settlement or even post-settlement agreements. So here's where the paragraph is changed under paragraph five, uh, alterations and risk of loss. or to disclosure that there is uh, a loss. 
and the uh, the purchaser shall maintain adequate insurance and then the seller shall maintain homeowners insurance uh, for the property now adequate insurance we really did struggle over the language here and essentially it's going to be whatever it's on the the shoulder of the buyer and seller to agree on what they feel comfortable with as the insurance and for the most part it's up to the purchaser to feel comfortable that, that their belongings will be covered if anything happens to the house flood water um, uh, rising the fire whatever it is okay so let me um i got one person who has in the question section that they are not getting any video if you are not getting video go ahead and raise the hand icon on your control panel All right. So it looks like it's two of you who are not getting that. Um, so I don't know what to tell you. Not a lot I can do if only two people are having the problem. So it may be something to do with the speed of the internet in the office or location where you are. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Not a lot I can do for that. But this will the recording will be posted later on. So we'll send out an email where it can be gotten. And you probably can follow along just by listening uh, for what we're talking about. All right, so pre-settlement occupancy. Um, again, purchaser and seller shall have uh, insurance, and that's K-1225 is the form. Additionally, under the pre-settlement occupancy form, um, thanks, Tim, we're, under the pre-settlement occupancy form, we are getting, we are changing it to reflect what's already in the regional sales contract, and that is the equipment maintenance and condition paragraph. Um, Will, will reflect the fact that the house, other than home inspection or agreed upon repairs, is as is. So the we added substantially before the same original condition and added as of the date of occupancy. So it now reads like this. Under paragraph three, hold on a second. That little screen thing here was in the way. All right. Um, as, uh, if reading starting down here at the bottom, after occupancy, purchaser shall maintain and repair the property, including all appliances, equipment, and landscaping in substantially the same condition as of the date of occupancy. So this is a requirement for that buyer when they move in. They have to maintain everything, landscaping, appliances, equipment, all of that, in the same condition as the date of occupancy. If they don't and uh, something breaks, something goes wrong because they haven't maintained it, the seller is not obligated to go and fix or repair it. Additionally, if they, for whatever reason, do not complete the transaction and buy the property and they move out, um, they would be required to bring that house back to the same condition, substantially the same condition as it was the day they moved in. Not the day to contract, the day they took occupancy. All right. I don't see any other questions now, so we'll keep moving right along. K1344 contingency clauses. First, we added the check boxes, which allow or disallow assignment of funds in the sale of property and kickout section. Now, let me just go for a, a rampage for just a minute here. Um, especially starting in 2006, we started, saw a huge misuse of the kickout clause. Uh, generally speaking, people were using it as a contingent with kickout for short sale, assuming that the uh, short sale itself was a kick out and that's never been the case it's always been a contingency the house was still contingent no kick out kick out is some previously set of, of statements that says if this happens we the seller have a right to go back so for those who are new in the business who weren't selling prior to say 2005 um kick out was almost exclusively and still to this day should be exclusively used for home sale contingencies so uh, i i have excuse me, I have a buyer who wants to buy your home, but their house is on the market. So I'm going to make the offer on the property and the seller is going to allow me to ratify with the condition I sell my house. The seller will put the property in MLS as contingent with a kick out. And if the, the, another buyer comes to the table that does not have to sell their home in order to buy, the seller can go to the first buyer and say you have X number of days, usually it's three or so, in which you can show evidence that you can move forward without selling your home or show us a contract. If you can't do either of those, we're accepting this other offer. So that was the ability to quote unquote, kick out the first buyer. Um, what we were also seeing is a lack of disclosure. And this goes back to like the 2006 revision of the contract. 
uh, when the market was really busy in, in four and five and, and six, uh, we were seeing a number of people who were bringing contracts and not disclosing the fact that they needed to sell their home in order to come up with a down payment to qualify for the loan to buy the new one. So the, the assignment of funds was a disclosure now that says you got to let the seller know when you're ratifying that you need to sell your home or it needs to close, even if you have a contract, before you can move forward. And we've got to check boxes now to allow the parties to agree or disagree to make the, the contract contingent on upon assignment of funds. So if you do have a home for sale, even if it's under contract, you should go back to this paragraph, disclose to the sellers, and then get the, their capitulation, their agreement to, uh, to do that. All right. We also remove the post-settlement occupancy option in the contingent clauses is for, contingency and clauses form of 1344. There was another paragraph that kind of set the tone for the post-settlement. We've got a whole different form for that now. So we wanted to get rid of redundancies and we removed that from this form. And then here's an example in paragraph four of contingency clauses. The seller will or will not accept an assignment of funds. Okay. Let's see, I don't see any other questions. So either I'm talking fast enough that you guys haven't caught up yet, or you just don't really care. That's okay. <laughs> That's good. All right. Now, the Virginia jurisdictional addendum. And as a reminder, the core contract is a similar contract that's used in parts of West Virginia, D.C., and Maryland, and Virginia, basically north of Caroline County up the interstate. And they, the core contract is pretty much set in stone, but it has jurisdictional addendums for West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. because there are specific components of the core contract that need to be addressed differently based on that state's law. For example, Virginia has a, a unique settlement or, or CRESPA statement that has to be reflected in the contract. So the state form, the jurisdictional addendums added to that form or married up to that form, we've added a line that says disclosure of sales price to appraiser, which allows brokers to disclose the sales price of a ratified contract, even if it hasn't closed, but only to a licensed appraiser. Now, let me be real clear in this, and let me actually go to the language. So I'll go there and then come back. So look at the second white block. You see the disclosure of sales price to appraiser, paragraph 14. This is a new thing. Your contracts are not, under standard of practice 113 and 115 of the Realtor Code of Ethics, which was adopted in January of 2006, your, your, code, your offer to purchase is not confidential. So if Amy sends me over an offer and I'm the listing agent, with the seller's direction and permission, I could share her offer with any other buyers who were coming to bear. And that's perfectly okay. But once you're ratified, that agreement between the two parties is nobody else's business unless the buyers and sellers have agreed to release that information, which is generally to the loan officer, the settlement company, an appraiser, maybe one or two other people who are involved in the transaction, their attorneys, for example. The, uh, at the urging of multiple committees and the Appraisers Association and several other groups, there is now this paragraph 14, which says the listing broker and selling broker are hereby authorized to release the sales price listed in paragraph two of the regional sales contract to any appraiser who contacts them to obtain the information. The fact that you're authorized does not mean you're compelled to do so. If you don't fundamentally feel that you should, or it's in the best interest of your client, you don't have to. It simply gives you permission, the buyer and seller, by signing this contract and not modifying paragraph 14, gives you permission to do so. I do think there's some considerations that a practitioner needs to make and doing this. Now, the, the first one, the first consideration is that in the best interest of your client. So that appraiser is not under any confidentiality statement. So you share your the, the sales price and only the sales price, by the way, is what you're authorized here, not whether there's concessions, not when the closing date is, not any other special arrangements or agreements. So you could only share the sales price. So I have a particularly low contract. My buyers really, or sellers rather, really need to sell. They accepted a lower offer because they had to. And that appraiser gets that information and shares it with the agents who are representing another transaction that he's doing the appraisal on, or he himself is also an agent, or he knows some agents he can tell that information to if they want to know or ask. And they do that appraisal 
Um, the other agents may be privy to that copy of that appraisal. You know, we all oftentimes get copies and uh, they could see what the contract price in that on your property is for buyers. This may not be good. And that uh, another agent could bring another buyer to higher price and, and try to solicit the seller to void the first contract if they could and move on. Um, I mean, there's a number of issues that do come up. The benefit is for the community as a whole by getting that information out. Hopefully it'll give better transactions. Also, the upside to this is I give um, Alfonso, he's the appraiser. I give him the sales price of my listing. He does an appraisal on the other transaction. And now those prices will be somewhat similar. So we do get the influence that make the, the market a little bit um, better. I, I'm not sure that's a, always a good thing, but it, it is an upside. Um, so let me, let me grab, there's some questions here. And I'm going to send some quick answers to clear out some of these. All right. Is there an opt out for either party on this disclosure of sales price in the contract? Uh, is there an opt out? There's always an opt out. They, either party could scratch through paragraph 14. Both parties could initial and that would nullify the opportunity to share the information. I mean, if you think about it, pretty much the only person who's going to be given this option, this question is going to be the listing agent. Buyer agents typically aren't going to be contacted um, by the um, the buyer agent will be contacted by the appraiser. Almost always it'll be the, the listing agent. And listing agents have a decision to make, uh, whether they feel it's in the best interest of their client or not. And some some of you, I mean, you've got a really good contract. You know it's the best that offer you're going to get. There may be a, no reason not to do that. Um, it may help the other appraiser and the other property and have all these benefits. Um, but for the most part, you really got to take a look at your contract and, and your transaction and where you just fall morally. If you don't want the authorization, if you or if the parties disagree with that information being released to appraisers, and again, it can only be licensed appraisers, um, they could strike through paragraph 14. That, that dropped out. Okay. So go back to the other change. We've also clarified the dates of ratification. I'm always surprised at how much confusion exists over when are we ratified and delivery on all those types of things. And part of that is because of custom. It is not um, uncommon for you to write a contract on an REO property and you get an email back from the listing agent that says, okay, we're ratified and we'll send you over the addendums. Well, no, you're not really ratified because those addendums are part of the contract. And you may see elements of that addendum that you don't like. And the, the REO company always has the right to revoke that agreement to your core agreement. Um, until you assign and deliver those documents. Th this is contract law that we have carried over um, from the 1600s. I mean, this is nothing new. It's been around for a long, long time. So we've clarified it so that everybody has a very good understanding of what the law really is as opposed to what the custom is. So we've clarified the data ratification and the new definitions clause. The date that the, uh, and by the way, you notice in my uh, description here, Date of ratification and definitions are capitalized as a reminder. And I know, you know, we all learned this in pre-licensing and then promptly forgot when we were excited that we passed the test. If a word is capitalized in the term of the contract, it seems out of place. It's capitalized because it's actually defined somewhere else in the contract, in the form. So that's why you see these kind of odd capitalizations. They're now a legally defined term somewhere in the form. Um, so under definitions, we've now clarify the date of ratification. It's the date that the executed documents are delivered to the other party, not the date that they sign that they sign uh, those contracts. So again, Angel's the listing agent, I'm the buyer agent. And I, I agree to these terms as the buyer, the counter that Angel's client sent over. I send it back to her, but I need the, the sellers to initial. So Angel gives me a call and says, okay, we're ratified. They, they've initialed. It is not binding and it is not truly ratified until I have a copy in my hands of the seller's initials. So I need a complete document with all agreements. That line that says data ratification should be completed when the person who has received the last change and all the agreements have been made physically receives the documents. Not So Angel in this case, being the person whose clients had to last initial, would not fill out the data ratification. It would be only when it came back to me. I fill out the data ratification, acknowledging I've received and agree that all the terms have been agreed upon, and I would send that page back to her. Okay, so um, 
All right. So Christine says, what constitutes delivery? That's a good question. Paragraph one of the Virginia Jurisdictional Addendum outlines the delivery. That's why it's capital D, because that paragraph is defined under the, uh, the contract. And so that capital D definition or delivery rather is that section we fill out where we put um, where the forms are delivered to, whether they're going by email or fax or hand delivered or addressed, wherever. If it's blank, it doesn't constitute. So if I don't put a fax number in, like I haven't for five, six years now, then you can't fax me anything and consider it delivered. So if I put an email address and I put my email address as the agent, only upon that delivery mechanism being uh, given, do I now have a ratified contract? You have to deliver in the way in which the contract set forth if you're abiding by the contract. Now, there is some, some, some fuzziness to that. There's some argument to that in that until it's delivered, you're not really ratified or bound by those agreements. So if you want to be crystal clear, you're going to use whatever's in that contract and start delivering that in that mechanism. Otherwise, we go to the common law element where I have to prove delivery. I have to prove receipt of delivery, by the way. Email would constitute that. Um, overnight packaging with a signature saying I received it could constitute that any number of things. But you really want to use what's in that contract as the delivery date um, to make sure you You've covered all the bases. You don't want to be default to any type of common law proof or evidence because then it's very subjective. Okay. Good question. All right. Any other questions about delivery or ratification before I move on? Okay. Very good. Okay, so those are the only changes for the jurisdictional addendum is the disclosure of sales price to appraiser and we have made very, very clear what ratification means. We think we've made it very, very clear. All right, the next one is the home and radon inspection. And this is probably the large, the, I guess, most substantial change, if you will. Um, and, and the last one we'll cover today. So as most of you have noticed, as you've pulled the forms out of zip forms, uh, that the home inspection and, and radon inspection paragraphs have significantly changed and be rewritten. Now, radon and home look very similar. There's very few differences other than a few steps um, and disclosure issues. It's the first time we've rewritten in a long time. So it was due for some addressing. It was, in, it was addressed to resolve some conflicts we've seen, but also, we wanted to make sure that we were covering uh, a, a better philosophy, and that is the buyers were in the previous home inspection. We were frequently seeing seven or 10 days to do the home inspection and then three, three, and three back and forth. And each party had their entire three days to consider, come up with uh, al alternate uh, responses and then send it back. And we saw people were even coaching them um, uh, I don't know how to say this, but we saw agents were coaching their clients to wait to the 11th hour to stress out the other side to, with the hopes that they would be uh, easier to work with and, and just agree to terms. And it was just kind of silly to sandbag for those three, three and three days. So we wanted to give it a much more fluid and kind of reflect what was already going on opportunity to go back and forth so that there were no technicalities in which the contract could be voided by one of the parties because you didn't wait three days or you went four days or whatever it was. So we've opened it up to more interpretation. All right, so I got another question here. All right, so if you deliver by hand to an office staff, how is that treated? All right, well, let's say, and, and this is going back to the jurisdictional addendum, there are two answers to that. One is going to be the home and uh, property owner association packet. The other one's going to be the terms of the agreement. If in the, in the definition or a delivery paragraph in the front page of the Virginia jurisdictional addendum, if you put your office address as the delivery location, then anyone at that address, unless you specify only to the agent's hands, could constitute delivery. So if my staff gets it, they throw it in my mailbox and hope that I see it two days later when I come in, so be it. If that's all you've put in that delivery line is your office street address. If you're gonna use an office street address, you wanna say specifically delivered to this agent or signature required. Now for property and association docs, that's a very different animal. If you put your firm's address in there as a delivery location and anyone in the firm who touches it, it starts the three day right of rescission at that point, which is why it's a horrible idea 
to put you or your office in that second paragraph on on the on the uh, I'm sorry on that second page of the jurisdictional addendum. Uh, you want to put the well, my opinion is you want to put the buyer's address, either email address or, or mailing address, um, and make the forms the POA forms go to that location. Um, hopefully that clears it up. I, I know. Well, I don't know that there's a whole lot of confusion. Every once in a while, we run into people who just, I'm going to go hand this off and give it to the agent that constitutes delivery. Delivery is very specific and outlined in the contract. So um, just because they've received it once or twice that way doesn't mean you should keep delivering it that way. Okay, thanks for your question. All right, so back to home and radon inspection. Um, yeah, so again, these changes have been given to give a much more fluid negotiation period between buyer and seller in which both parties have equal chance to work out a deal by the end date. As always, a reminder that if you give the parties a certain number of days to negotiate, we'll talk about some recommendations in a moment, and they can't get to a resolution, then extend the period. Don't just keep negotiating because at some point, the negotiation period expired and the buyer is usually the one who's going to uh, suffer if that happens. So you want to extend it through an addendum, which takes no time at all, especially when you're using digital signature and DocuSign and all those types of things. All right. So a reminder, um, the home inspection, if you don't use a home inspection, the home is still st sold strictly as is. That's been the case since uh, I think the 2006 changes of the, the core form. Now, there are three primary goals we addressed when we made these changes. One was to eliminate the confusion about what the buyer or seller may ask for and when. So no longer do they have to wait their turn to come back. They can negotiate and give ideas back and forth in a fluid manner the whole time. Uh, we wanted to simplify the exchange between the buyer and seller during the negotiation periods. And we also wanted to reduce the number of contracts that were unintentionally becoming void. And what we mean by that is um, Angel and I are back in our transaction and we are negotiating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And um, I, I went four days and she went three days and she's within her terms, but I went the fourth day. So really the contract's void because we didn't find a resolution. We never wanted that to happen. We wanted people to be able to talk back and forth because that's what customarily was happening. But no one was claiming that there was void until they got ticked off and said, no, no, you know, we've been talking for two weeks. Technically, the contract was void and the buyer should have made an election a week ago. Uh, we're done here. You, the buyer, need to move forward. We're not talking anymore. And, and they would have been, generally speaking, in the rights. So 1342 um, was changed in the following ways. Now, and this has always been the case. This isn't a change, but a full report um, must be delivered no matter whether you void the contract or you're asking for repairs. The, the buyer is compelled to deliver before they can void um, a full report. Now the question comes up all the time. Well, can the buyer avoid before getting a home inspection because they just saw stuff they didn't like or they want out? No, because they can't deliver a full report, which is a condition of the inspection's ability to, or buyer's in, uh, ability to avoid um, without getting the inspection. So they have to get the inspection. The full report has to be delivered. Um, and this is a going to be a change for a lot of people. Not only do you send over the list of requested repairs, but also recommended remedies, because what we see a lot of is very sloppy work in which the buyer agent says the buyer requests the following five items be repaired. And that's all it says. Well, but what does that mean? The refrigerator isn't working in the ice machine. Do you want it repaired? Do you want it replaced? Do you want cash for it? You know, what, what do you want done? Don't just tell me it's broken. Tell me what you want done to repair it. So the buyer has to make an election. Um, of what they want fixed and how they want it addressed. If they don't want to move forward, they have the right within the first set of timeframes to void the contract. They still have to deliver the full report and a notice. Remember, notices are unilateral. They don't require the seller to acknowledge or agree to. It's just a notice saying, we're, we're done, we're out of here. They still have to get a release of contract uh, addressing the earnest money deposit, but that doesn't mean they're bound by the contract anymore. Secondly, either party may initiate, let me go back to that for a minute and just add a caveat here because we're, we're doing okay on time. Let me give you that scenario again. I, I'm Angel and I are back in the transaction. She is the listing agent. I'm the buyer agent. I send over a unilateral notice, a one page that says notice at the top. And it says, Angel, we are not moving forward anymore. Here's a copy of the full report. I'm not obligated to tell Angel what we don't like, simply that 
we're not we're done here's the full report we don't like the house we don't feel comfortable moving forward we're moving on rather at that point in which i can prove angel received the the notice then proof is very easy if, if email is what she has in her notice paragraph on the jurisdictional addendum then i can email her and if i can prove i should sent an email that's good enough i don't have to prove that she opened it so i sent her an email with the notice saying we're voiding the contract um here's a copy of the whole report at that point the transaction is done we have the technicality of releasing escrow and escrow cannot be released without the buyer seller agreeing a court ordering us a broker dis discretion with a 30-day letter or another type of um, uh, legal action. So at that point, Angel should put the house back on the market. The fact that the EMD hasn't been resolved doesn't mean you have a contract anymore. It means the EMD needs to be resolved. So the house should go back to market. Don't harm the sellers by trying to work through the EMD release. Okay, so uh, Christine says, what happens during the negotiation period when a seller opts to not respond at all? Um, I'm going to get to that in just a second. We've addressed that as well. Um, the short answer is the buyer will have a certain period of time in which to consider the fact that they've been ignored, and then they're going to just move on. Um, the buyer can either accept it as is or, or move on. All right. If you guys ask questions, I'm putting a little quick you know, answered or K here so I can clear them off so I can organize the questions better. So I'm not blowing you off. I'm, I'm really putting... Um, and they're just opening up. All right, Larry, go ahead. Your microphone's open. Or it was. Okay. Or I just kicked you out by accident. Sorry. <laughs> there you are. It's not getting went down. Okay. All right. So go back to our form. Either party may initiate the offer of a credit or counter offer at any point during the negotiations. So even though you've gone back and forth 15 times, you can still go back and say, okay, how about I just give you a credit? I'm tired of talking about this. Let me just give you money so you'll go away. Or the buyer can say, you know what? I, we, we asked for 10 things to be fixed. We just really want three. The other things, it doesn't sound like you're being real responsive. Of. We're gonna take those off the table and just move on. Um, next, individual response times are eliminated. So no more of this three, three, and three. Now we're given one bold time frame in which parties can uh, talk back and forth. And if someone doesn't respond, there's going to be a, a, a period of time. The buyer has to consider that and get out. Okay. So the contract doesn't become void, as I mentioned earlier, because of a missed deadline. I explained that already. And the buyer's ability to exercise their option to void may be made at any point prior to ex expiration negotiation period. So the buyer can anytime say, you know what, we're not happy that the seller is not responding to us. They've ignored us for three days. They haven't even, and this happens, the seller hasn't even acknowledged receipt or told us, you know, what they're thinking. All right, we're done. We're voiding. But remember the second that I send that void notice over. So let's say email is a permit, permissible delivery mechanism. And I email the other agent with the void, the notice of voiding. The contract is done. To resuscitate that contract means you really need to rewrite, renegotiate a whole new contract. You can't just say, mm, yeah, no, okay, I'm good. It's not like high school dating where you can just date what so long as you like that person. And then when you don't like them that day, you're done. And then tomorrow you go back to them because, you know, they're comfortable, whatever the reason is. Um, once you send over a notice voiding, you, you've voided the contract. You're moving on. Now you have to decide how earnest money is dispersed. But the contract's done. The house goes back in the market. And if you want to buy it still, you need to write a new contract. All right. I've also um, changed the contract so that right during negotiations, you can address the issue of what happens if the um, the seller uh, doesn't have the utilities on. For whatever reason, this has been a huge issue in which a seller doesn't have uh, utilities turned on. I'm, not, I'm just not sure what the problem is or why people don't understand that, but they, they don't. So... Uh, let's see. I got a couple questions here. Uh, yes, that's one of my favorite analogies here. Um, how many days do you recommend putting one B? I'm going to show you the form in a minute. Catherine, it's a great question. I'm going to show you the uh, form in just a minute, and I'm going to share with you what my recommendations are. And let me just say right up front, my recommendations are not reflective of the committee as much as mine as a broker and agent. Um, the committee makes no recommendations as to language. It's up to you guys to decide based on the context of the transaction who you're dealing with and how much time they need. So 
I'm going to give you some examples of what I'm using in the form. It's up to you, your broker, and your your buyer and seller to figure out what's you, uh, specific to um, their situation. All right, so we'll get to that form in just a minute, and I'll answer your question then. Radon language provides guidance for sellers' inspection standards. So now, there's a lot of language in the radon and, and um, uh, radon and home inspections match one another. The radon section is uh, going to have guidelines for the seller based on EPA guidelines of what they need to do to make the house ready for the radon so as to get proper readings. And if they don't, if they can be, if it can be proved that they tampered with the, in the uh, radon test, there are going to be remedies built into the radon inspection. Uh, if the radon inspector believes that it's been tampered with, there's going to be some ways in which the um, buyer can get the radon done uh, correctly. It also establishes credentials, which are again based on EPA standards. The forms committee met for a long time with several experts in the radon world to rewrite this form because it's become such a prevailing issue in so many, I mean, basically every house has radon. There, there's none of them that have a zero reading, um, but it's gotta be a safe level. And how do we go about protecting our clients and some of the legalities in that are being addressed in this form. Um, and it does allow for air both air quality and water tests. Radon in the water has become, as most of you probably know, a big concern and that can be inspected using the same guidelines we've given here. Okay, so let's see, there's a question here. How about if the seller and buyer come to terms and one side changes their mind within the negotiation time period? Um, if the negotiation time period is gonna terminate if there's an agreement. So, um, so you and I are going back and forth with our clients and the seller says, okay, great. We're just, you know what? We're tired of this kind of nonsense. How about we just give you $5,000 to fix it? They send that over in writing. The buyer signed it. Now, again, nothing exists in our world unless it's been executed in writing by both parties. So this whole uh, concept, well, we had a meeting of the minds. We just hadn't reduced it to writing. It's not enforceable. Nobody cares. It's got to be in writing in order for people to care and for it to be enforceable. So the seller said, yeah, we'll give you five grand. The buyer signs off and says, we agree. Delivery occurs when it's sent back to the seller with the buyer's signature. At that point, you're in agreement. The buyer can't come back and go, oh, you know what? Now we changed our mind. Five grand's not enough. We're rescinding that agreement. We're moving on. It can't be done. Once the parties have agreed in writing, delivered to the opposing party um, with full signatures and execution, you can't just go backwards. Good question. All right, so here's the, uh, let me fix this, sorry. I got to move the little, you can't see it, but I got to move the control panel all the way so I can read the, the form. Okay, so here's the new inspection. Here's paragraph one. And I'm going to paraphrase just as a hopefully, um, you guys have already read this hopefully, so I'm going to paraphrase. So the contract contingency is until 9 p.m., which is inconsistent with the rest of the contract, X number of days after ratification. Now, the old way, what we were seeing was people putting 10, 3, 3, and 3. Now, do the math on that. Let's say I took a full 10 days to do my inspection, give you the, the copy of the report, give you what I want fixed. The seller takes three days to consider, the buyer takes three days to consider, the seller takes three days to consider, and then we're ratified. That's 19 days. I mean, that's a really, really crazy long time to be fooling with this. All the while, both parties are either off the market or racking up expenses for moving forward in the transaction. So 19 days is way too long. Um, you can put 19 days in here if you really want to, if you really like the old way. But for here, I would say probably seven days is enough to do a home inspection. Now, those of you who are much further north, where it's harder to get on the schedule of a home inspector, or those who are further, further south, like in Caroline County, where there's a limited number of home inspectors, excuse me, um, then then you may need more time. But seven days, 10 days, eh, it's, that's kind of long to me, but you know, that's what the parties want, that's what the party want. So you put that first blank in there of however many days, seven, 10, whatever it is. The second blank is up to you. My recommendation is it should mirror the first blank because what that second blank says, the first one says, I have X number of days. So let's play with it and say seven. I have seven days after date of ratification to get the inspection done. And by the way, before the end, before 9 p.m. on that seventh day, the seller's agent should have in their hands a copy of the full report, your list of repairs, and what you want done, how you want them addressed. 
Okay, so that needs to be in their hand by seven days. You don't have seven days to do a report and then get the report over sometime after that. It's got to be in the hands of the listing agent um, before 9 p.m. on that seventh day. How whatever way is addressed in the Virginia jurisdictional addendum. The second blank we have here is what happens if I arrive as the buyer and the utilities are not on? Now, this is a very global statement. Utilities are not in service. Utilities are described elsewhere, but it does include the gas for the fireplace or the stove or whatever. That's a common question we get is, you know, well, everything was up and running except for we didn't have the gas fireplace hooked up. If the gas fireplace is conveying is real property, there's got to be some type of gas, even if it's a can you got outside from, you know, your grill. There's got to be the gas has to be on to be tested by the home inspector. It's part of the real property. It's affixed to the property. It's being conveyed that way. Um, it needs to be inspected. So if you get there and the utilities are on, electricity is off, gas is off, whatever, then you should have another number, X number of days to redo the inspection. Those days start, your, your timeline starts only after notice. Uh, look and see that notice is capitalized. So it means it's, it's a defined statement. Notice from the seller to all the utility being in service. Now, notice goes back to our delivery definitions and notice definitions and how that's conveyed. So um, I would need that in writing. So let's say Debbie Kay and I were working a transaction and um, my client did not have the gas on when she got there. So I get the gas company to come out turn it back on, fill up the tank, do whatever I need to do. I don't call Debbie and tell her it's on. I need to send her written notice by either email address or office address or fax if that's what she's listed in the contract to be delivered. From the day that I can prove, I, the listing agent, can prove I've delivered the written notice is appropriately delivered, the seller, I mean the buyer, has X number of days, whatever you've put in that blank, to redo the inspection. So um, again, for me, seven and seven is probably healthy here. I would love to see more five and five because I don't like these long-term extended inspection periods. Too much can go wrong. Too many people have to pay money during that period. Um, so the five and five, if you can get a home inspector out there that quick, seven and seven, okay, uh, if you really must. All right. Now, what we also did in this form is no longer do we have small itty bitty print for, for void and um, for entire copy and all those types of things. We've, we've laid it all out in much easier to understand language and much larger print. Yes, it adds some paper to your stack, but hopefully all of you are doing digital stuff and DocuSign and emailing and not printing and writing and do all that stuff. So you're not killing as many trees, but um, it's now much clearer that if the results of the inspection are unsatisfactory to purchaser, the purchaser has the right to deliver either one um, an entire copy of the report and a written addendum listing the specific existing deficiencies of the property and what the purchaser would like the seller to do to remedy them. Or number two, so they don't have to do both, they do one or the other, an entire copy of the report and a notice voiding the contract. Those are the two options they have. All right, the next line says if the purchaser doesn't get their inspection done uh, prior to or, or give me a copy of the reports prior to the deadline listed in that first paragraph, the contingency becomes void and we move on as if there's no contingency, the house becomes essentially as is because it defaults back to the core contract. All right, so paragraph B, all the parties have until 9 p.m. X number of days after the uh, delivery inspection addendum. So paragraph one talks about how long do I have to do the report and deliver it to the other agent. Paragraph B says, from the time I've delivered it to the listing agent, how long do the parties have to go back and forth and figure this out? Me personally, I think five days is enough to figure out where you are, maybe even too long. Again, there's no official recommendation from the forms committee because everybody's unique and specific in their transaction. For me personally, five days is going to be my default because at the end of day four, I'm going to get a feel for whether or not the parties need more time. All right. So the seller says, you know what? I want to get a structural engineer here, engineer. You know what I'm talking about. A structural engineer to come in and look at this. I'm going to need more time. Then they should do an extension for this, this period. Don't automatically assume from day one that you're going to need extensions. Just go with a, a smaller, more reasonable time frame to go back and forth. The party need more time, fine. Because here's what you're going to happen. In the psychology of the sale, if a party thinks they have seven days, they're going to wait to seven days. They're going to think they have buffer room. They're going to put it in the back burner. They're going to put off hard decisions until the last minute. 
And then you've got little time to go back and forth and negotiate. So shorter time period gives you more of that time of the essence feel and lets you move forward at a much more rapid pace, putting some impetus on the, uh, the, the parties to find a resolution. At any time during the negotiation period, and this is something you should remind your sellers of, um, the purchaser or seller may make, modify, rescind, or alter as many offers and counter offers as desire. They can go back and forth as many times as they want. They don't need to wait a certain number of days anymore. Um, and they don't have to wait for a response. So to Christine's question earlier, I I'm the buyer. I'm, a, I'm sorry. I'm the, yeah, I'm the buyer agent. I send over to her a list of 50 things that need to be fixed. And it's a crazy long list. And I want them all to have top dollar repairs. And the seller hasn't responded in two days and I'm calling Christine and Christine's, I'm doing the best I can. The seller just isn't answering. They're a little irritated. Uh, we're going to get back to you. I promise. I go and tell my buyers and the buyer go, you know what? If he doesn't want to respond to us, two days is a long enough time. Send them a notice avoiding. They can do that. They don't have to wait for response from their last agreed upon or last um, uh, statement. They can terminate anytime they want. Sellers need to be made aware of this. That the seller is going to try to sandbag, thinking that has some tactical ability. All they're doing is risking the fact that the buyer can rescind their repair list and simply send them over the void. All right. So Fred has a question. What is not clear? What it is not clear what the repair would be due to the nature of the repair. I'm sorry, I don't understand. So example, siding is dinged by hail. Not clear if it can be repaired in, at time of home inspection, so it may have to be replaced. Large difference in cost to seller. Also, would the seller have to match the color or the damage section or have to replace the whole wall? Okay, all those things are, Fred, all those things are negotiation period issues. So there's no uh, compelling thing in the contract by design that says sellers must do all repairs to brand new manner. What's going to happen is the buyer is going to say the siding has been damaged. We understand because of sun bleaching, you're not going to get exact colors. We want you to do as close as you can, um, and we'll be happy with that. And the buyer, the seller says, you know what? I need time to find a contractor to get pricing to see if I want to do that. Then the seller is going to have to send back to the buyer a notice saying, I need an additional five days or 10 days or however long. I'll agree to these things. I'll fix all the other stuff, but I need an additional five days to see if I'm going to agree to re-siding my house. So those are all negotiations issues. They will not be addressed as a com uh, anything compelling the seller to do that in the, the typical contract. All right, purchaser's election. Let me go back here. Um, so paragraph A is how long I have to do the inspection and get the report to the other agent. The second line is if the utilities are on, how long do I have to um, do that inspection once the seller has given me written notice that they are back on? Paragraph B is how many days the parties have to go back and forth. So let's say five days. Paragraph C is at the end of the five days, assuming we use five days, at the end of that time period, the buyer has their time to, to consider their options and agree to the last thing that was negotiated or the fact there was no negotiations at all. So seller never agrees to anything the buyer wants. They get to the end of that five-day period in paragraph B they can have X number of days. My recommendation is two. They have two days to, um, to decide whether or not they want to move forward. The seller cannot come back and, well, technically the seller, I guess, could come back and try to resuscitate this and go, okay, 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 we'll pay five grand, uh, pay five grand for the signing. But the, the purchaser can just make a decision at that point. After the negotiations, thus have settled, they've gone back and forth. The seller can say, you know what? we weren't able to reach an agreement. I need some time. Now, if they do reach an agreement, the, the purchaser doesn't get like a two day right of rescission. This is only a protective clause for the buyer. If the seller won't agree to any of the terms the buyer wants in the paragraph B timeframe that was given. So say five days, do not make this a long, long period of time. It, it disadvantages us. If you're a listing agent, you don't want a long period of time, one or two days. Maybe if you're the buyer agent, of course you want a few extra days, but even then your buyer, Remember, under the terms of the contract, your buyer still has to send stuff to their lender. They still have to pay for appraisals. They still have to pay for title search and all the stuff that they're doing. So you don't want them to be occurring those costs and running down that clock in the backside while they're trying to play some type of game and trying to consider what's going on. Um, encourage them to make a decision quicker here. 
Okay, so that's the home inspection. We've made it a little bit, or a lot simpler in my opinion, uh, much clearer in what the terms are and given lots of room for negotiations and addressed a lot of what ifs as well. That what if the utilities isn't on comes up all the time. All right, radon inspection. So moving from there to the radon inspection, same thing. How many days do I have to do the radon inspection if the utilities are on? Because you do have to have normal airflow and utilities have to be on in a house in order to do radon inspection. How many days do I have to do the test if the utilities aren't on and I have to come back? Also, who has to pay for that? And guess what? Um, the seller is going to have to pay for that. If they don't have the utilities on because the contract requires it, the seller may have to pay for any cost for reinspection. Okay, so radon testing um, guidelines are all EPA based. We've given three things um, that need to be done and they have to be done 12 hours prior to the scheduled test period. So you're the buyer agent and your client hires the radon inspector. You're going to send a notice over to the, the seller saying we're going to do this inspection on Wednesday. So the day before, at least 12 hours before, the seller has agreed to in contract in the contract to make sure all windows are shut and remain shut during the inspection period. And the inspection period could be, depending on the type of inspection, could be three days. So they're agreeing from 12 hours prior until the end of the inspection, all the windows remain shut. Doors should be used only for normal ingress and egress and must, be, and must not be left open. So no airing out the house. The whole house exhaust fan or smaller fans near the test device cannot be used. So no, um, none of those big square fans you see in the middle of especially older houses that suck up all the stuff into the atmosphere um, and no small fans because all these things will, will screw up the tests. Now, if your home inspector is using what we call the lazy way and they're putting a canister in there, you can get at home Depot. Um, it's hard to prove any of these things weren't done. Your more professional and better home inspectors or radon inspectors are using very sensitive equipment. Um, it's a couple thousand dollars, probably three to $5,000. And it will tell you if there's been any type of tampering with the system, Ab abnormal airflow, um, uh, lots of uh, movement in the device, covering up the device, any type of tampering, it'll tell you. If the home, if the radon inspector feels or can show evidence that the, well, actually, I won't even say it shows evidence. If the radon inspector says that the test has been tampered with um, and he does so in writing, the seller will pay for the new test. Right? That's a very important under B. If the radon professional says in writing that the requirements aren't met, the seller is going to pay for the new test. And it's automatically extended X number of days. So you need a new test period. You probably want that to be five days or so because you want the house to go through its normal airflow, give notice to the seller so they know to limit their going in and out, close the windows, do all those types of things. So you probably want about five days in there. All right, if the radon, and this is important too, because this is a question I get pretty often, mainly from brokers um, uh, who call me, you know, agents don't know, um, agents go to the broker, the broker will give me a call. Generally, the, the agents um, let the seller negotiate it, but I want you to be real clear on this one. If the radon report confirms the presence of radon, it equals or exceeds the action level established by the EPA. Purchaser at the purchaser's sole discretion shall provide seller prior to radon testing deadline. One, Okay, so this is what the seller has to do. Either they have to give an entire copy of a radon report and written it down and requiring, I'm sorry, purchaser, requiring the seller at the seller's expense uh, and prior to settlement to mitigate the radon condition by contracting with the NRSB or NRPP listed remediation firms to reduce the, the presence of radon below the action level established by EPA. Um, and provide the purchaser with written retest results performed by a purchaser selected radon professional following the required test. So let's be real clear what this is. When your seller signs this addendum, they are saying if radon is found in the house and the buyer wants to move forward, the seller will agree to pay. This is not going back and saying the seller has the right to, and we're going to negotiate it. The seller will fix these things. If not, they're in default of the contract. So I, the buyer, do an inspection. The radon comes back at greater than four. I'm going to give a full copy of the radon test and an addendum, which says seller in accordance with B, paragraph B1 of the radon inspection. You are going to fix these things. You are going to mitigate the radon. You're going to do it with a NRSB or NRPP approved firm. And you're going to pay for a retest 
to make sure that whatever work they do has reduced the level of radon below the acceptable limits. Now, this is a big change from what we had before, which basically says the seller at their discretion can do this. If they decide not to, they're going to move forward. Now, the seller is saying, if there is radon, I'm going to fix it. If they don't want to agree to that, that needs to be negotiated before ratification, not after the inspection results come back. Um, all right, so the next one is an entire copy of the radon report and notice voiding contract. So just like a home inspection, either A, seller, you're going to go fix this, or B, a little different than a home inspection where you negotiate it. So the seller's going to fix it, or B, Here's my radon report, it's too high, I'm not comfortable, I'm out of here. And they have the right to terminate, but only after they've done the radon test. All right, if the purchaser doesn't get this done in the time frame that's set out, then they move. the contract moves forward. They, the contingency is expired, there is no contingency, you can't hold them back to it, you can't come back later and say, oh, whoops, I forgot, we're gonna do it again, unless the seller lets you, and then you need to do that in writing. C, if the event of B1 and the party shop until 9 p.m. after the purchase or delivery of the radon addendum to negotiate mutually acceptable written terms. So let's say the seller does come back and say, even though they've agreed to at their expense to get this done, they go, no, I'm just not going to do it. I can't afford to do it or something else. The seller, the buyer could accept to do this. See that they're compelling the seller to do it. The seller can't. The buyer has the right to get out and they're not going to mess around with this. D, the purchaser's election. If at the end of the radon negotiation period, the parties are unable to reach an agreement, the purchaser shall have X number of days to decide what to do next. That's a protected clause. There's no more you know, going back and forth. One or two days, like the home inspection, is probably acceptable. All right, so let's go back. The remediation, the seller will do all these things. If they say they can't or won't, the buyer can get out. There's, there's not a whole lot else. We're not going to retest. There's no negotiations of whether the seller will pay for half and buyer will pay for half unless the buyer wishes to do so. Um, and then the purchase election does get out. Okay, so now that's it for the changes for the January change. July, we'll have some more. Um, one of the, you may have noticed, I for those who are reading the screen, um, there were some couple tweaky word things that weren't consistent in the home inspection and radon inspection. If any of you got early releases, you saw that, that's been fixed. We, we've fixed those clerical issues now. Um, so that they do mirror each other exactly the same. Um, all right, so I'm going to open up for questions. If you want to use your microphone, you can raise a hand icon, click the little yellow hand. Um, and if you, let's see, I've got at least one person here or not. All right, Nancy, your microphone's open. Go ahead. Oops, sorry, I couldn't hear you. All right, so I'm going to clear that. So if you do have a question, you can put it in the question section there. I'll wait just a minute for folks to catch up. I know that the audio usually comes out slower to you than when I said it, so I don't want to just shut down. Okay, well, I don't see any questions, so hopefully I covered everything. If not, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is cbematthew at gmail.com, cbematthew, two Ts, at gmail.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. You can also find uh, information uh, about me at matthewrathman.com or theagenttrainer.com. And again, thank you so much for your time today and, and your interest in uh, keeping up to date with everything. That's really important. It helps us in the committee uh, to... Um, to avoid any confusion by having you guys join in the conversation. So thanks so much, and I will see you guys around.